Okay, so welcome everyone. Um, what I'm going to present here is, as you can see, a joint work by a lot of people. Uh, probably one that worked the hardest is Shin Dosun. So just, you know, I'm just here to say. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, I'm going to talk about <laughs> the problem we're trying to solve, but from a different end. And here's what I'm trying to um, see. No, it's good. So, we have detailed data footprints collected, a lot of data. If you've been in this conference, we're doing a great job of data, okay? Short from wiring our students, we are gathering a lot of things. We're even doing a, lot, a very good job at about this sophisticated algorithm, because once you have the data, you have to decide. Do I do clustering? Do I do uh, LCA, latent class analysis? Do I use a neural network? I mean, there's a lot of tools to throw at that problem. And that's, that's okay, that's perfect. We also create a lot of interesting predictive models. And you know, I can probably anticipate when my students are going to do something because I threw all these algorithms in there and selected the best one. But how do I apply these actions? And this is my personal view, you might disagree, but we don't see much activity here. And this is kind of a thing, I wouldn't go as far as to say that we see sweep under the rug, but sometimes we fall a bit short. Because after I throw this neural network algorithm that is giving me a prediction factor that is fantastic, pretty much all of us think, yeah, but I need to act on that and I need to find out why. And another um, condition that we have found in the past is that the way we apply these things by no means is something that we can tell all our academics. Oh, no, no, this is going to be probably an expert, right? I think we need to go and crack that nut. I think we need to go and, and try to solve that problem. So, the way I'm looking at it is, first we identify one, I wouldn't say easy, but one problem that was easy to relate to, which is retention. Retention is very easy to act upon, right? If you have the data, if you have the algorithm, and the answer is this person is about to leave, then the action is very easy. You just pick up the phone. And this is one of the actions that institutions have been doing. You pick up the phone, make a phone call, hey, Sarah, what is happening? And it's actually effective. Sarah says, well, you know, I'm kind of having doubts. And, and you solve this problem. But you solve it because you took the data, you did the analysis, you act. And you act on that, and it works. <coughs> and this was a little bit of like our initial uh, use case that was fairly successful. Then we move a little bit more and say, oh, you know what? This gets a bit more complicated. And if we try to do, like, for example, anticipating academic performance or predicting final performance. And we also have very interesting contributions in there. But there, the emphasis is not so much on what we do with it. The emphasis is much more on this is the algorithm, this is the model, and the model predicts the scores fairly good. But again, then is yeah, but if I give it to all my academics in my institution, what do they do afterwards? And we're not paying too much attention about that. This is another very interesting work coming out of Michigan, if I'm not mistaken. E2 Coach, no, this is Sigma, Purdue. E2 Coach is the next one. Signals gave us already a, a bit of a hint about what can we do to act better. And they said, all right, we're going to do all this analysis, and we're going to put three labels, well, mediocre and poor. Now, if you ask me, I can go to all my academics and say, would you like something like this? Would you know what to do with this? It's like, oh, yeah, yeah, well, mediocre and poor, that's good. I can act. So we're reaching that gap a little bit better. Where's my niche slide? Somewhere. Oh. Got wrong? Okay, so our point here is that it'll come. It'll come. It, it should need some time. <laughs> My point is that we pay a lot of attention to these other issues, which are important. Don't, don't get me wrong. Okay, data collection and algorithms for prediction, they are important. But we don't think as much about how do we intervene and how do we do it carefully and how do we allow everybody to feel comfortable with those interventions. So this work that we are presenting here is a little bit of a an initial step to explore that a bit further. And this was pointed by Alisa Weiss, by the way, a couple of years ago, thinking, you know, this is kind of like the ugly part that we don't want to deal with, or, or we don't devote so much attention to that. There's the Michigan oh, Thank goodness. Now, the reason why I put it here is because Michigan gave us a very good hint on how to proceed. So we gathered the data about the state of the students, we identified the action to take, and then they started to talk about how do we deliver feedback. And actually, these people have messages and catalogs of messages that are given to instructors to then go and provide the feedback. So this is a very good example of, uh, in which we walk the whole path, not just focus on one or two actions. <coughs> All right, so what is our objective in this work? We want to explore a little bit that last stage. 
And can we provide instructors out there in general with a model that is easy to understand? A model, something that comes out of a statistical package and it doesn't scare with a lot of them and say, oh, I don't know what to do with this. Let's explore that. So what we're doing here is, all right, we're going to try to allocate indicators, factors, that come out of the model that are directly connected to the learning design. So if you have something in your learning design that says, my students are submitting an assessment, there will be something about the assessment in the model. So you can relate it to what is happening. Then we're going to try to achieve a predictive model. And with this predictive model, let's see if we can try to reach this knowledge you derive from the model and actions you take immediately in your scenario. So the way we proceeded is, all right, we have an online environment. We're going to capture lots of events. And we're going to do uh, counts of those events directly related to your activities in your course. Then what we're going to do is, let's connect it to something that is easy for academics to relate to. And we chose a, a scenario that has a midterm and a final exam. So what we're trying to do here is, all right, let's see if we can connect the model with midterm, final, we predict, and we leave you just two inches away from intervening. And the approach we are taking is we're going to pick an algorithm that is going to divide your cohort into categories. And again, we believe this is something that we still need to scare our audience. Uh, something is going to come and it's going to say, okay, you have different types of students, and these are the different layers. Can you do something about it? Now, then we go to the toolbox. And if you open any statistical factors, you have one gazillion algorithms. And out of those, one with gazillion algorithms, they have so many parameters that are very difficult to manipulate. So what we did is change a little bit the angle and say, is there a model out there that could work with a lot of factors, numerical factors from different types of sources, and would give us a good enough interpretation? And we chose recursive partition. And I'll show you in a minute why we chose this algorithm. Basically, the driving force is that the model that comes out of that uh, algorithm, it's a bit closer to an easy interpretation. And some of you might say, well, this is not easy to interpret. But I would argue that it's easier than other models. Okay? Let's see. Uh, so the scenario here is regular course, 13 weeks. Um, there are weekly activities, uh, some of them formative summary. We captured a lot of events about these videos and exercises. There's a dashboard. And this is something that lasts for 13 weeks. The first week, nothing happens here. Week six, there is an exam, the midterm. So we're looking basically at trying to predict what happens in the midterm, what happens in the final. And in the midterm, we're going to use weeks two to five. And in the final, we're going to use weeks seven to 13, and a population of 272. So these are the initial conditions. This is the data we fed to the algorithm. And even though you are probably not going to understand anything in there, the most significant part is this row on top. So these are factors, even though here is the cryptic name you put in your statistical package. You can reverse this very, very easily because uh, VIDPL stands for video play. How many times the video was played? And VIDPA, how many times the video was paused? And therefore, you can go back to your instruction and say, we are counting here, you know, how many times they are stopping the video. Because some students, they play and pause, play and pause because they are reviewing carefully the video. So this is a factor that will tell you, yeah, this student is getting a lot of action there, or just a little bit of number of events in there. And the same thing for um, questions here, correct and incorrect. Again, this is very, very close to the type of uh, report you get from the submissions, right? Uh, your score is three, 3 or 5 or 10. Well, you get this in here. It's just that this is the massive amount of data that we are collecting, and this is very important. We are collecting every week. So this is where we're getting a lot of data, where we are maintaining these labels directly connected with your learning design. So what happens with this? We feed it through the algorithm, and this is what we obtain. Now again, some of you might say, well, this is far away from the type of thing that a regular academic would interpret. But our sense is that we're getting closer. The recursive partition in algorithm gives you this solution. And this solution is interpreted as follows. You just have to start reading from the top. And when you read from the top, you'll find here one of your indicators. This is the number of incorrect questions, sorry, incorrect answers in the exercises. And it says the following. If the number of incorrect answers for the exercise in week 10 is bigger than 22, yes, then you go here. So what we are doing is dividing the population for you based on certain values on these factors. And the algorithm computes the order in which you ask for the values, and it computes automatically for you 
these decisions. So you might be beginning to think, oh, oh now this is already too complex. But again, I think we are very close to provide something a bit simpler, which is, well, look at the bottom. These are the labels that we're going to provide an academic, which is this node number four is estimating a midterm score of six for nine of your students. Nine of your students will, we are estimating, don't have a score of six. And we are estimating that 18 of your students will have a score of 9.9. .9. So what we're doing here is basically dividing your cohort. And dividing your cohort in very specific categories. Now, as you can see, the division of these categories is not something regular because this is what the algorithm does for you. But now what we're trying to explore, we haven't gone that far yet, is if I give this to an academic, I'll say, well, we are anticipating that your students will be classifying this as estimated score. Will you be able to go back to them and talk to them? Or send them a message or give them feedback? That's basically the bottom line of the whole story. Of course, you're not going to approach a student and say, oh, we're estimating you're going to get six. <laughs> but you do have the opportunity to talk to a population that you are estimating they're going to be somewhere nearby to a score of six. And this is something that you can interpret based on this condition. So if the number of incorrect answers to the exercises is bigger than 22, and the play of the videos is less than 8.5, 8 then the score is six. Our hypothesis, we haven't tested that, because I'm going to show you what we did afterwards, but what we are hoping is that if I am an academic and say, OK, basically, this person is going to we have an estimated score of six because the number of incorrect answers is very high and the number of video plays is very low. So that gives me a little bit of a hint and say, you are here in this category because of this. I'm not going to tell you that. But I'm going to approach you and say, by the way, you should probably give it another go to these videos. They are important. And the topics that you're talk talking about is, and you give some specific feedback. And also, uh, the exercises, it, they are about this topic. You seem to be struggling with a post in the forum your doubts, or post in the forum the three problems that are more difficult to you, and we'll do something about it. And you can tailor that message to the 90 individuals that are in this box. They can replicate a little bit of this. OK. Uh, how good is this? Right? I mean, I kind of like went very quickly over, yeah, this is the algorithm. It seems magic. So where's the catch? Why do we need to pay attention to the algorithm? So the catch is that you need to know about the quality of these answers. So let me go back a second. When you have these, these scores here, uh, the answer is not so much the score. Yeah, it's going to be 6. You have to know about, OK, how much of an error going up there? Because if the error is between 0 and 20, uh, yeah, it's useless, right? So I think the bottom line, and this is what we studied in this paper initially, is can I live with this type of classification? How good is my algorithm? And this is the measure we try to catch up here with the root of the mean squared error. And basically, if you look at this column mostly, to go quickly, for the midterm, which is a, an exam with a score between 0 and 20, the mean, the root of the mean square error is 3.98, 3.8 for different weeks. So what this means is that if you go back, this 6 over here might be plus minus 3. And this 14 over here could be plus minus 3. Now, is this good? Well, it's not ideal, right? You would like to have something like plus minus 0.5. But that everybody that plays the data knows that this is very difficult to obtain. It's very messy, very noisy. So our hypothesis is that still, with this error, we can give instructors these categories and say, look, you have this instructor. They have a little bit of noise. So don't go really uh, strict on your analysis. But still, you will have certain categories in which that you can use to modulate the message for your students and say, do something. And more importantly, you can do that in week two. We capture events in week two. We are three weeks away from the midterm. And I'm beginning to have a little bit of a flavor about the category you might be end up in. So you're, again, you're not going to go back to your students and say you're going to fail. But you'll begin to start establishing that conversation early enough. Okay? And same thing for the other um, weeks. This table over here is the same for the final, in which we use week 7 to 13. You can see here that the error is bigger, but, and I mentioned it probably in some slide and I, I jumped into it, the score for the final exam is between 0 and 40. So the categories that you're given is plus minus 5. So again, it's something that if I have a category that has 32 plus minus 5, I know they are there on the upper quarter. If I have another category that has 10 plus minus 5, okay, I'm dealing probably with those that are very low on that margin. So 
mostly what we see here is there is an algorithm or an interesting trade-off to explore between the complexity of the model to interpret and the quality of the results we're getting. Might not be ideal, the quality, and in order to get really good results, we probably need to explore many other algorithms, options, and parameters. But we're losing something important, which is the easy interpretation of this model. And I think we are get, it's getting us closer to this interpretation by an academic that says, oh yeah, 100 students, they are divided into these categories. This seems to be a, an approximation. This approximation is an error. I need to be aware of that error. And I can do something about it. Five minutes for That's it. Okay. So, um, conclusions. What have we done here? Uh, we follow this path of saying, okay, let me see if I explore a trade-off between the power of the algorithm and the simple interpretation of the model. And we explore the use of this simple interpretation. What we are proposing here is, first, make sure you choose indicators that are close to the design. They are not something obscure that comes out of a sophisticated data analysis. That way, when you give this tree, tree to your academics, you could say, you see, if you look at these two or three indicators, which, by the way, are the things that you're doing, right, or you're proposing to your students, the estimation is 13 out of 20, 13 out of 40. Uh, the algorithm we chose was the hierarchical partition to see what kind of results we obtain and the quality of the results. Is it a catastrophic quality? Is that something we have to throw out the door? And we realized that for this scenario at least, it seems to point into the right direction. The student partition here is respect to this midterm and final. So eventually, you are giving the, the instructors a tool they can use immediately. It's Friday, week three. Let me like a, look at the tree, look at the conditions, and throw out some messages out there to see if I can influence my students. Um, the performance, I would say, is acceptable. It is nothing to be uh, really surprised about. And some of you may argue, well, this performance may change from one scenario to another. Absolutely. Uh, the performance here maybe is too high for you, plus minus three. However, I still would argue it's better than nothing. And it gives you this kind of advanced warning uh, at week two, three, four, a few weeks before the, the final exam. And again, what we're trying to see if we breach this gap and we achieve immediate action by instruction when we see the bodies. That's, that's all. This, uh, this picture was taken this morning. This is Shane, this is Draga, you know, playing the beach. <laughs> in, in the sunshine. In the sunshine, in the yeah. sunshine. Thank you, Abelardo. Please, Neil. Uh, that's a really cool talk. So, the. Uh, uh, so, um, I send messages to the 72 kids in my class, right? Uh, the, there, there's something cool about what you've done where you put these into categories. It tends to make you want to think that we should then, the message should really just be based on that category. But, 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 but in one sense, you don't want to actually tell all the kids in that far left category, watch more videos, because there might be a few that actually didn't, right? But there's no reason that the messaging can't actually just instead not be based on category, but include just like, well, your absolute number of videos you watched is actually, you've watched like 3% of the videos, right? Like, and then that way it's like really, it's concrete to them. Uh, like, so it can have value even if you also use concrete stuff, right? Yeah, that's, a, that's a very good point. So the way we interpret the, this result is this is pointing to a, a bit of a messy space because you have these categories, but you're, you're absolutely right. I cannot, I might have the students in this category that watch more videos than others, right? But still, you can modulate the message in a way that is a bit, uh, I wouldn't say ambiguous, but a, a tad generic, and say, look, you, you know these videos are available. You know we're discussing this topic. could be you know, fraction multiplication. And you probably need to review them thoroughly again. And maybe that, again, doesn't apply to this person. But again, if you receive that message, it's like, ooh, yeah. Huh. Ultimately, the goal is, if I send these messages a bit more personalized, they will be more likely to achieve a change. So, so the other extreme scenario is if I send an email to everyone, say, I'm detecting that the videos are not being used that much. Yeah, I'm losing credibility because 80% or 50% of my audience said, yeah, I'm using them. So what are you talking about? You know what you're saying, right? So you're losing a little bit that connection and then ca that capacity to influence. So I agree with you. You have to modulate that. And this is something that, you know, the. Um, digital skills or the, the professional development has to probably make people aware that they're using this type of tool and these effects have to be taken into account. Totally, totally agree with that. So one of the uh, 
uh, areas which I think is a challenging one is the generalizability of these kind of questions. I'll take the object of this research is about communication essentially. Um, you focused upon engine, one engineering cohorts, uh, the kind of the pedagogic intention in different disciplines or even different teachers may be vary. Sometimes the class, the cohort size might be too small to to work on. You have two seven three, which is probably a reasonable number, maybe in combined honours courses or you know, how have you addressed have you got any cutting ideas for how to deal with uh, the features that you had and to, to kind of rescale or standardize them somehow that we able to accommodate differences in pedagogic intent? Okay, that's a that's an excellent question. Um, we gave it a little bit of a thought and uh, even though the scenario is engineering, the type of features we are including, um, they tend to be as generic as possible. Let me elaborate a little bit more on that. Uh, using videos for class preparation, using multiple choice questions to make sure that the low level type of uh, concepts are understood and, and you remember a few basic facts. Give you material to read. Uh, some of the indicators are just accessing material online. Now, it is indeed a case study for engineering, but that type of learning design, if you will, would propagate, and I agree with you in advance, not to the whole type of scenario, but a bit more beyond engineering. And I actually do have a, um, an example at Sydney University, somebody that is teaching the interpretation of x-rays in the Faculty of Health and Sciences. And they were able to transform that type of approach because for them, Interpreting X-rays is also about videos, right? So you can see that the coordinator of that course said, "Oh, yeah, I have a few videos explaining how to do that." Okay, fantastic. Can you come up with a multi uh, set of questions for them to try things and, and do a basic recall? And it turned out that he had already a bank of questions. So that learning design kind of like migrated perfectly there, and he's getting these numbers. We didn't go as far as to show them the tree. but he's getting these numbers and the data is being collected. So my guess is that with certain caution. This learning design would propagate a bit beyond engineering. But again, I was talking to somebody here about the basic rate writing skills, and that's probably a completely different scenario, and then the mileage would be certainly less than that. Uh, thank Secondly, um, I'm not sure if I got this right, but if you go back to the results page, 
Um, is the results that you are um, the one where you could show the errors? This one. So the week 13, is that using uh, information from week 7 to 13 or just from week 13? Uh, you would expect it to get better over time, closer to the end of the course. And I was just wondering, do you have an insight of why? Yep, this is a very good question. Let me go to the first question first. Um, the situation you describe of the students uh, not engaging at all or not getting any <coughs> activity and still performing well, we do have a little bit of that. Uh, it varies a lot from week to week because some topics are a bit more uh, proximal to what they know and some others are not. And my thoughts on that is you need to you need to increase the level of precision on how you measure that. It could be just you know having some preliminary really nice exercises and if you see that they are doing something very quickly and correctly, then you are assuming that yeah, these people don't need to, to exercise something like that. I do have formal uh, summary assessment every every week, so they have to and they actually do. So you, you can avoid these type of things. Now regarding to this results is a very good question. We actually do incremental analysis. So week 13 is, is using all the events. Now, the reason why this is so high is because in week 13 what we have is an overflow of activity in the events. And therefore, it's a little, in other words, both the students that are actively participating in the course and those that haven't done anything, both of them engage a lot in, the, in that week. And therefore, that's why the reliability of that week is lower. Another interpretation is, OK, we are in week 13. The final exam is tomorrow. I would be much more interested in these numbers over here, which is where you probably have a, 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 a bigger capacity to turn things around. And this is basically the, the cramming effect of the mark, of the test. Uh, someone, someone at the back has his hand up. Yes. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. This is a, a great analysis of how to break up the space. And I was actually following up on her question where I think I've had, and I think a lot of us have the intuition, that we shouldn't do more than one thing at once. We shouldn't experiment more than once. We shouldn't have two people experimenting. And I, I actually want to need to question that assumption because I think there's a lot under it that may turn be false. Like what you said, maybe it's actually good when you send out many interventions at once. And also the fact is that experiments are happening all the time. It's just that we don't know what conditions they take on and we don't have any idea of how they interact. So um, now if, when everybody says it moves, even though some people already said we should just do one intervention, others are pushing back and say, no, any one intervention has a 5% chance of working, which means you basically did nothing. We should actually be crossing them independently. So in a setting of independent intervening, as long as everyone's recording randomization, you could do your study. You don't have power to detect interruptions, but you know what? Expecting interruptions when you need to get main effects is like, why do you want drowning in the desert when you're digging for water? Yep, yeah, yeah. Um, I, I agree with that. Um, this scenario is not as flexible as a MOOC in the sense that this is a regular course, it's live, so it's basically, yeah, it's a naturalistic approach. Uh, students are seriously working on this, so yeah, you can capture all this information and make some sort of uh, analysis, and, and we didn't go as far as to uh, act on these categories, but if you do, then you also have to be very mindful that this is a, a course that, that needs to run and needs to run with a certain level of quality. And I agree with you, I mean, it's a very noisy channel. Uh, more than one intervention at one, yeah. The, the type of results or conclusions you reach, you have to take it carefully, I think. So we're actually at time. If anybody, I'm happy to keep going if people want to keep doing questions. No. Yes. There's <laughs> several, several burning questions. Shall we go a few more minutes? Go on, go ahead. Uh, can I ask you, uh, uh, let's say we have 15 points for our assessment. Did you try to evaluate where lies, for example, the error? For example, let's say I predict that the student will achieve three points. Is this error, for example, spread more in for these three points than, for example, when I predict 12 points? Mm. Did you try to implement this? Uh, the two measures that we have, mm -hmm. they remain more or less the same. So the error we were having in the midterm and in the final was more or less the same. And that's why we thought, well, if it is that percentage, it's still OK. It's equally effective. And again, this is one specific scenario. But it might happen exactly what you just said. No, I mean, like, let's say at least students are those that have less than five points. Oh, in the categories, you mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I believe the algorithm doesn't give us that information. 
although we could compute it. Yeah, that's that's a good point. We didn't look at because that. Because, for yeah. example, when we, we do our predictions, we are quite good at predicting each student. Yeah. But the third one has some So the spread of the error might be different, different for yeah, categories, yeah, yeah. correct. Yeah. That's a good point. We didn't look into that. Thanks. Last one. Go on. So on those two tables, you're doubling the test size, and the error increases by the square root of two which is mathematically what you would expect under certain assumptions. So it also creates a reverse intense incentive to test the students more to reduce the error. And uh, we've been seeing that coming from the teachers as well. Testing the student more would be increasing the frequency of the tests. Is that what you mean? Or increasing the number of questions in an individual test. To reduce the, the error. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good point. But yeah, I didn't, I, think, I didn't think of that connection. However, I would expect that uh, your criteria for the learning design would be, yeah. <laughs> so then you could have teachers gambling the system, so to speak. <laughs> yeah, that's a good connection. I didn't think of that. But I mean, this is my personal view. The structure of a design is a very delicate thing. So I would put in front of the I would give the highest priority to see if I can increase academic performance, not so much reducing my predictions here in the algorithm. So if I see that the assessment scheme is more or less adequate for my learning outcomes, I would let that drive the design. Yeah. Okay, I think we should call a halt and let everyone